Hi everybody, um, good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Tara Gratz and I'm with Rural Directions in Clare, uh, just facilitating this evening on behalf of BIG. So I'll just quickly introduce Georgie Keynes is here with us from BIG and she will give you a little bit of an introduction into their group. So Georgie, I'll just throw to your screen. No worries. All right, all good to go. Thanks, Tara. Um, thank you very much for coming along to this webinar tonight. Um, I'm a facilitator for the Barossa Improved Grazing Group. We're an umbrella organisation that brings together the different livestock production groups in the Barossa and surrounding areas. Um, we really have a keen interest in sustainably improving our soils, our pastures, our livestock, our people and our business. If you'd like any more information about BIG, there's our website there, but we've also got newsletters. We run a lot of different webinars um, and information, so videos and case studies and fact sheets about the sorts of things that we do. Um, so if you want any more information, please look at the website for more. Um, I'm really excited tonight to introduce Tim Marshall from TM Organics. We all know that soils are a really, really crucial part of our business um, and our grazing system. Um, in the Barossa we've had a really long hot summer and it really makes you realise how important your soils really are um, and looking after them and improving their health and um, the biology and the organic matter and their water holding capacity, how important that really is. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to Tim for, for hosting this webinar. Um, so I'll hand over to him. Thanks Tim. Thank you. Right, so our topic today is improving soil health. Sorry, Tim. Sorry, just before just before we go to Tim, we do have a couple of poll questions to get everyone started off tonight, just so that we can get a better understanding of where you're all at. Um, so these will appear directly. So if you could just click on the poll, please, as to where you're located. Excellent. Now we can, you should all be able to see that, I hope, Georgie. Um, we've got 16% from the Barossa and surrounding, surrounding areas, 3% from Murray, Lands and Mallee, 19% are from the Adelaide Hills and Fleurio Peninsula, 13% from everywhere else in SA and we've got a really big interstate contingent tonight at 48%. So if you could also then just let us know what your predominant production system is, please. Beautiful, thank you. So 6% I've got merino sheep, 15 maternal or composite. 44% with cattle, 21 crop and livestock, and 15% have got others. So one last poll before we get started. Could you just let us know what your predominant pasture system is, please? Alrighty, so we have 9% with annual pastures, 34% perennials, 37% have got a mixture of annuals and perennials, 11% are cropping and stubbles, and 9% are others. Excellent. Thank you all for participating in those. It just gives us a little bit of an idea, which is much appreciated. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you all over to Tim Marshall, our presenter for this evening. 
and we will get started. So Tim, that should have asked to show your screen. Right. Beautiful. Excellent. Okay. Over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, so today's uh, topic is improving soil health. Um, quite a lot to say, so I can only say it uh, will be int introductory, but I hope it's uh, of interest. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a uh, uh, an author, consultant, trainer, best known probably for my work uh, in, in compost and uh, also with organic um, growing, especially soil certification, and also work as the biodiversity and large-scale revegetation projects. So a few books, you might be familiar with the Dung Beetles uh, book, Dung Down Under, um, magazines, Acres Australia newspaper, I'm pleased to say will be restarting uh, very soon, very popular paper, and um, I, in various different capacities, including farm inspector, consultant, trainer, journalist, and other things, make a claim no one else, I think, makes. I have been to nearly 5,000 certified organic properties in 33 countries. So soil health, we need to consider the physical condition, especially uh, what we call water stability, uh, stability no hard pans, uh, chemical aspects capable of providing the full array of nutrients and um, biology, that's a microbial activity in our soils. And management, of course, is a very important part of this. So managing our pastures to maintain complete cover, to keep uh, everything actively growing. And uh, the concept that I come from is that for, to have everything actively growing, to have in each season, a variety of different plants that are, that are actively growing because then they'll be producing the maximum, uh, not only containing the maximum level of nutrients, but uh, producing the maximum level of uh, phytochemicals, of medicinal chemicals such as antioxidants and other things, able to regrow quickly after grazing and managing um, grazing rotations and, and other, uh, other aspects of our livestock. So how do I know if my soil is healthy? It should be uh, open to oxygen and water. There should be obvious cracks and pores um, and for roots to move through the soil, some sort of obvious soil life, good structure as indicated by breaking apart into clumps and root tips should be healthy. So we're looking at our, at our roots, as you can see in the picture there, there should be plenty of them and you notice that they're very white with no dark lesions or brown or black spots and unimpeded by a hard pan. Also, the earth should smell quite pleasant, almost sweet and what I would call earthy. But definitely no, no uh, off smells. And then, of course, our plants should be healthy. So that's a picture of a very, very healthy soil. So you can see that it's full of pores. So there's no impediment to water moving into that soil to uh, insects and other things moving around and to roots pushing their way through that soil. And that's the pasture from the picture that we just saw of the soil and uh, the diversity um, of that pasture is quite lovely. So how can I increase um, my soil health? Basic, basic principles, minimise cultivation wherever we can to reduce organic matter losses, which would be uh, burnt up and of course not produced while soil is, uh, hasn't got plants on it. So everything we can to keep uh, keep soil covered with pasture or crops or mulch and to increase organic matter production. So ideally we want to move away from long fallows, um, use natural inputs and uh, mineral fertilizers based on soil te uh, testing and minimize as possible, um, as much as possible any harmful inputs. So using input such as compost and other biological or organic materials. When we have to use chemicals, uh, use them very wisely to uh, reduce harm. For instance, in this example, uh, can we avoid worming treatments when the dung beetles are there most active period. 
and then managing stock, of course, to get uh, best control, uh, use of our pastures, but also control parasites, etc. So um, a variety of different uh, natural materials here that we can use. Uh, compost is familiar, of course, humates or coal extracts, and sometimes brown coal itself. Uh, seaweed and fish products, usually in a liquid or powder form. Uh, crushed rock fertilizers, a variety of sorts. And then the biochar, zeolites, and diatomaceous earth. So diatomaceous earth is the remains of a single-celled organism, and like the biochar and the zeolites, uh, supplied with lots and lots of uh, open spaces that can capture water, capture nutrients, hold it in place, uh, be a safe place for uh, all little uh, microorganisms in the soil to hide away, and to hang on to nutrients and release them slowly as they need. Green manures and crop residues, of course, and sorry, and uh, and uh, animal manures. So, um, if we um, have to use um, more stronger fertilisers, then trying to choose a uh, uh, a less harmful form of that, for instance, uh, the sulphate is ammonia there, or the single supers. Uh, uh, recommend as being less harmful to the soil um, because uh, soil life can be harmed by some of these inputs, especially muriate of potash, triple super, and anhydrous ammonia mentioned there. Uh, that they can kill organisms rapidly acidify soil and reduce organic matter um, levels. So this was a traditional view of how we made a lot of our input decisions. In farming, it's called Liebel's Law of the Minimum, and uh, basically it says that okay, when the, when the, the the first nutrient runs out there, in this picture is going to be the nitrogen and the potassium. So plant growth is going to stop or very much slow down. And of course, there's nothing wrong with this uh, view; it's not incorrect as such, but um, it's uh, it dominated our view about how to treat so uh, soils and how to gauge uh, inputs for a very, very long time. And by itself, it's not really enough. We should be looking at some other things. So this picture looks a little bit complicated. It's what we call uh, for Mulder's uh, chart. It's uh, used by those people who adhere to the, the work of, uh, of Albrecht and uh, his way of, of uh, measuring the correct cation balances within soils. So uh, in this system, we're not just looking at adding nutrients according to a, um, a, a simple analysis of how much is removed by cropping, for instance, but uh, looking at the balance between those nutrients and how we can make, make adjustments that allow us to access what's already in the soil rather than bringing new materials in. So in this uh, system, we say that levels of one nutrient can affect the availability of another uh, nutrient. And some of them are antagonistic, and some of them are favorable. So some people find that picture a little bit hard to understand. So I've just tried to simplify that a bit in the chart form, where you can see on the left-hand side that the, uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, ammonia in the form of nitrogen is uh, you know, capable of suppressing um, quite a few forms of nutrients, and also um, all the other nutrients down there. If you over, if you use phosphorus, for instance, you may uh, need to apply uh, copper because you may, in fact, uh, be affecting the the uh, availability of uh, copper. So that's an interesting picture for you to consider um, uh, uh, when you review. Um, this webinar, and some people find that a little bit easier to use than Mulder's chart itself. But there is another consideration, and that is that pH um, can strongly affect the availability of nutrients and also the ability of microorganisms to survive in the soil. So you can see from that chart there that uh, uh, phosphorus, for instance, is, is uh, poorly available in a uh, an acid soil, but it's also similarly poorly available in an alkaline soil, um, whereas uh, um, uh, nitrogen, for instance, is you know, much better available in the high pH 
and is affected by this by low pH soils. So the concept in uh, an alternative way of treating soils is to, uh, to try to fertilize to produce organic matter rather than to directly feed the plant. So we're trying to get the soil ecosystem working so that it produces uh, and makes available the nutrients we want at the right time um, as plants need them and as uh, soil conditions allow. So uh, first of all, we need to correct nutrient deficiencies and we'd love to see that done on the basis of, basis of soil testing um, and drive the ecosystem itself to look after our plants. That's the suggestions there. Uh, the obvious things we're going to do to do that, like um, uh, maximising plant growth, uh, retaining stubble to mulches, using bulky inputs such as compost and other recycled materials, control and erosion so we're not losing any of those things. And, uh, the end point of the breakdown of this organic matter is to provide to, to produce uh, humus. So humus is the, the end product of this breakdown process. And you see that picture on the side of the screen there indicates that humus is involved in all the other processes uh, involved in, in the soil, to the physical, the chemical, and improving the physical, chemical, and biological condition of the soil. And, the processes that happen within the soil, and uh, and there are no negative indicators for trying to get uh, more humus into the soil. So every measurable parameter of the soil will improve if we can improve our organic matter uh, content, and especially if we can improve our humus level. So that's not just the raw organic matter that's allowing it to break down and to make this humus product which you can see there in the picture, about that very open structure, again, the way I described the zeolites and the biochars, those little open structures uh, allow uh, water uh, to get in there, microorganisms to survive, they can get in there and survive in a droughted soil, for instance, um, maintain air in the soil for those organisms and plant roots to use. Um, and uh, and roots and uh, find the root hairs and um, can find their way into those pores. So uh, this humus works to improve our nutrient content. Up to 95% of the nitrogen in the soil is actually stored in the humus, and it's stored there for a very long time. So the average age of a piece of humus in an Australian soil is probably a couple of thousand years. Uh, a large percent of our phosphorus and a big chunk of our sulphur is uh, locked into that, that humus product. Of course, we're trying to get uh, more humus, but the point is not to get more humus, uh, but to process some of the humus back, what we call mineralizing, uh, so that some of, uh, some of the nitrogen, phosphorus, sulphur, and other things become available. So we're not just trying to accumulate as much as we can. Of course, like to lift our, our uh, organic matter and humus levels as, as high as we can, but we can uh, continue to process them. So can, we can lift the total exchange capacity of the soil and that improves our ability to store nutrients of all sorts. Um, especially some of the cations, which are otherwise subject to being uh, leached away, for instance, uh, in, uh, in soil moisture. Our soil organic matter produces these uh, organic acids, and they help to um, etch away or break down the minerals in the soil and make those available. Um, and then this pH will also be a very strong buffer against pH changes. So humus is directly useful for the plants. Uh, the spaces allow the uh, microorganisms to get in there and activate some of the nitrogen. Um, and uh, and the, the, you know, the roots, as I say, can easily travel their way through the soil. And then if we can open up the soil in this way, then we can store a lot more uh, water. We can get 
grain into the soil, for instance. So one uh, one experiment done with infiltration tests in a um, in a very um, a worm uh, wormy soil on a soil with uh, uh, 70 worms per cubic metre uh, infiltration of uh, uh, of uh, with water in a measured test took 80 minutes and with 2,000 earthworms per square metre uh, same infiltration in the test took one minute so again trying to get as many pore spaces into a soil as we possibly can and in order to try and build up this uh, humus or organic matter within our soil we should know that uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers tend to favour those uh, microorganisms, microorganisms that consume carbon rather than the ones that build um, humus. So uh, uh, if we, if we with, with high nitrogen inputs, sponsor those particular types of microorganisms, then it's very hard to also actually build up um, carbon levels, levels in the soil and where we see a farming system with high levels of nitrogen inputs, generally the carbon is in fact declining. It's very hard to build it up. So we can build it up, of course, by using legumes, all sorts of other uh, microorganisms and composts. So any organic materials that contain both nitrogen and carbon, such as compost, and, um, uh, they, they'll help us to uh, to improve those carbon levels. So here mates are another example of that. These things are ex extracts from uh, coal deposits. Uh, they're very long lasting. They're simply applied in uh, mainly in a liquid form. They're often, because they're excellently chelating, in other words, they're excellent at grabbing and holding on to a range of nutrients and micronutrients in particular, getting those into the plants. They're great carriers or, or, or magnets for for uh, um, some of our uh, micronutrients in, in particular. So we you can buy these humate products with um, all the nutrients and trace elements that you might like to apply. Now, if you can find a way to use compost, they're also excellent to use. That's a picture of an on-farm on -farm composting system. You can also get uh, compost these days, uh, trucked over most of the country from commercial producers. If you're going to buy compost, it's really good to learn to make a visual assessment of it, to uh, look at its, uh, its colour, its texture, its smell again, smell should be pleasant, um, and no off smells. Homogeneity, in other words, it should be pretty much broken down and looking very much the same all the way through. And uh, you can also get microscope tests for, for for compost. If you're buying large amounts of compost, of course, then the manufacturer should also be able to show you a fairly recent uh, chemical assessment of that. Of that. Because composts are bulky and hard to apply, we believe that we can get a lot of the benefits of compost with actually using liquid extracts from the compost rather than uh, using the compost themselves. So uh, I'm going to show you two recipes. This is a recipe for a bacterial, the dominant um, uh, product. So uh, a couple of litres of worm castings or a good um, compost, uh, especially good homemade compost probably, mixed with, uh, and according to the recipe, uh, molasses and other ingredients such as humic acid, um, a liquid kelp or powdered kelp, hydrolyzed fish, and water, and uh, it's very simple to learn to, to do this. You can see there a picture of a very simple uh, arrangement in a small tank in a in a shed, and just using uh, pumps, very just much like aquarium pumps, to keep this product moving. Uh, many of you are familiar with a home worm farm, where you simply water the top and take the uh, the liquid out the bottom. And uh, that's a very good thing to use on uh, garden plants and indoor plants and other things. But if you can imagine just running the water through that uh, 
that sticky gooey uh, worm compost which you can see in the picture that's not necessarily going to shake a lot of the soil organisms off what we're basically doing here is is with the pumps is shaking as many of those um, beneficial organisms as we can off of the compost with the continuous um, uh, uh, stirring adding to that then some food such as the molasses to really grow the bacteria very fast and uh, the humid uh, uh, humic acid and, and kelp to help to uh, to, to um, um, make that a more valuable product and to hang on to those things once we put them on, into the soil and uh, it's pretty simple to use how to do this process in this example we're using a, a, a similar recipe but this is designed to give us some more fungally dominant um, product so you'd use this much more on um, on uh, cereal crops grassy cereal crops on um, on perennial crops such as grapevines and those sorts of things but also perhaps if you are trying to add more fungus to the soil and we'll get to a slide describing that shortly so um, the point of uh, getting these microorganisms is um, not to be able to pick out a few useful ones but to put them there in an ecosystem if we can um, put them in and the uh, the microscope test that we can do on the compost and the and the uh, compost teas uh, are trying to tell us the levels of these various things because uh, they each need something to feed on and to feed on them so that they will keep going and maintain themselves in the ecosystem so in uh, uh, we to, to deal with acid soils we can add in the system uh, rime and um, perhaps even dolomite uh, try and increase soil organic matter and improve the processing turnover of that organic matter and then if possible reduce the input of high value nitrogen fertilizers which will compromise uh, carbon capture so the problem with our fertilizer nitrogen is it's easily leached it's easily volatilized it acidifies the soil and in large volumes acidifies it rapidly it uh, makes it very hard to store soil carbon by burning that up um, and in excess it can produce too much protein this is both in plants and animals and for instance if your plants are receive too much of a boost of, of nitrogen they're basically busy making proteins which form the the, the, the shell of a, of, a, of a plant cell but they're not being able then to infill the in infrastructure properly and you get a plant which is sappy and and weak so at least 50 percent of our fertilizer applications generally is leached or volatilized and that could be much higher if we're careless with how we use them and um, uh, it, um, it's hard to hard to get uh, really good efficiency even with the most careful use so another thing we need to discuss is this uh, uh, VAM or vesicular arbuscular mycorrhiza these fungi that live in the soil and um, they are feeding off uh, some of the residues of uh, roots as they push their way through the soil some of them are actually able to grow into the root and uh, we now know that between 30 and in some particular plants 50 and even 60 percent of sugars more commonly 30 percent of the sugars produced by a plant is actually pushed back into the soil and it's done not not uh, not um, as some sort of excretory process or, or anything like that it's actually done to feed these um, mycorrhiza and uh, certain beneficial bacteria and other things uh, they then um, uh, are able to uh, grow a much more exploitative of the soil uh, so we can in potentially increase the root area of our plant uh, by 10 or 30 or 40 or even uh, more times so that they're much 
better at um, exploiting the soil to get the nutrients that we need. Um, now, once upon a time, we used to think that uh, these, uh, originally, we thought that these fungi might be uh, harmful, they might be pathogenic. Then we discovered, and especially in the example of Australian banksias, that they were very useful in helping plants to obtain uh, potassium. And later, as our knowledge uh, built, we discovered that uh, zinc can get it get rapidly into plants via these dams. But now we know that a hot, that most plants um, have uh, have um, mycorrhizal associations. So no longer a, a few plants like Rexias and other things that have them or other uh, mycorrhizae. It's now known probably 90% of plants. Brassic is being one example of plants that don't really make uh, mycorrhizal associations. Almost other uh, or other uh, plants do. They are of course damaged by cultivation. So these um, some of these uh, uh, sort of mush, uh, uh, fungi are actually responsible for do producing the many mushrooms that we see in our field. And if you know that uh, if you you don't normally find a lot of mushrooms in fields that are subject to um, cultivation um, uh, because cultivation breaks up those uh, hyphae or those fungal strands and makes it hard to survive. Um, and uh, also they can be quite sensitive to phosphorus fertilizers again, which is why uh, our mushrooms often are on the roadside or in the pine forest rather than them in the fields. The herbicides and other things, what um, phosphate fertilizers cause them to disappear. So we can buy these van um, pretty easily these days. Um, that's just one example of uh, uh, of a commercial version, and there's pictures of uh, these these uh, little hyphae which are growing out from from the plant tip. So learning to look for these things is uh, really useful. You may need a uh, magnifying glass to be able to see um, these mycorrhizae from, uh, from from close up, but you should be able to see the fine white hairs on the healthy plant tips um, just with, uh, with careful looking. So that's just a little introduction and I hope there'll be some questions about how to use some of these products and uh, and more about their benefits. Thanks very much for that, Tim. Are there any questions? Great presentation that really gave us a good introduction to soil health um, and all the different ways that we can really improve it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. Are you there, Tara? Have we got any questions that have come through? We'll just wait for Tara to come back on. Um, but Tim, I had a quick question about when the best time to put sort of some of these things out. Do we have to wait for the soil to be wet um, for everything to sort of go in or, or can we put it on dry soil as, as we've got at the moment? Well, um, almost all soil inputs are going to go in much better when the soil is moist or when rain is expected. Now, some of the materials are alive, such as the um, the, the um, aerated compost extracts or compost peas, and the, the 
the, the uh, VAM. Um, so those things you really do need soil to be moist enough to sustain life. Now some of the solid ingredients uh, like the uh, humates, uh, they're, they're, go they're going to remain in the soil but they will be activated and be most useful when there's adequate moisture. So when, when basically when plants want to grow, that's the best time to put uh, some of these products on because they basically operate like plant products and um, be much more effective in the growing season. Yep. So another thing that we have to just wait for that rain <laughs> at the moment. Um, Tara is just coming through with a few more questions. She's just having a few technical issues. Um, one other question. You there, Tara? No. There, Tara? No, so we'll just wait for, for her to get that stuff sorted out. Um, one other thing that um, I found really important, so the mulching side of things and not overgrazing. Um, this year's been pretty difficult for, for that side of things, but um, do you want to just talk through some of the benefits of leaving some of the cover on the soil and that side of things? Yes, certainly. Now, of course, it's much harder when uh, uh, we haven't had adequate rains and it's tempting to um, push to the limits. The better, better, of course, that we can improve organic matter and humus within the soil, so we're going to store a lot more, um, a, uh, a lot more moisture in the soil. And um, also those mycorrhizae that we talked about, they can, uh, it's well known that they can get um, nutrients into soil. They can also scavenge for water. Um, so uh, so that, that that's, uh, um, it's always good to have, have those things. Um, the uh, uh, so it's good to have organic matter continuously being processed into the soil, both from the soil surface, and it happens a lot from the roots of plants. So roots are really, really important in building soil organic matter. It doesn't all happen at the soil surface, but um, just a little exercise that you can do, which is really simple. Uh, you know that we talk about an A horizon in the soil, which is usually dark in colour and where most of the roots are, most of the nutrients are. And then we have the B horizon, which is usually in our conditions um, um, a paler colour and um, uh, fewer roots and then the subsoil. But if you get down and look very closely at the surface, at the surface we actually have our compost layer and we call that the O horizon or uh, the organic horizon. And uh, if you look under under your, anywhere where there's plants, in your pasture or in your garden, and if you look under mulch, you'll see this very fine, little, very dark layer. You see only perhaps one or two, um, and not more than about three millimetres thick. Now, if you if you got that, everything is processing, being processed into your soil. But if you actually take that area and remove the mulch, or remove plants, you'll see that that organic layer disappears on a sunny day in about two hours. And that's a pretty good sign of the fact that you're no longer processing that organic matter back into the soil. Brilliant, thanks very much for that, Tim. Um, we've got, Tara's just typing me through some of the questions that are coming through. So we've got one from Kim. Um, she's written, we've noticed a decline in dung beetles this year. Has that been noted as a general situation across the southeast? Yes, it has. And dryness, again, um, is largely responsible for that. So um, we, uh, the, the dung beetles have to dig, and they're very effective diggers, but um, we know that our soils are getting a lot harder as they dry out, and that is inhibiting uh, beetles. So yes, it has been noticed that there are that there are fewer. This is not a big season for dung beetles. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, and one question from Tim that says um, ways of maintaining soil health through dry periods. So they probably just covered a little bit of that in the mulch side of things, but are there any other ways or you know, practical tips that you've got, Tim? 
Well, with with all drought preparation, it really helps if we've started beforehand because um, we uh, um, just looking uh, here if um, if we have five percent organic matter, we can store about eighty thousand liters of water in um, a hectare in the in the top uh, fifteen and thirty centimeters. Um, if we double that to one percent, we double the amount of water we can store. So if we can get to two or three percent organic matter, that's uh, now we've gone from eighty thousand liters per hectare to four hundred and eighty thousand liters per hectare. And uh, you know that some of our most fertile soils that can be four and even five percent organic matter, five percent so eight hundred thousand liters of um, of water stored. So you can see that's a that's a tremendous increase in available water. Um, also, um, if those soils, if we can keep them open and in that open structure with lots of pores, then half an inch of rainfall uh, makes uh, is actually going to make a difference because it's going to get into the soil rather than sitting at the soil surface and evaporating off or running off. And also those um, that those mycorrhiza fungi in particular, they're also helping us to access water as well as nutrients. So definitely helps to have started that process as early as you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, a question, we've got lots of questions coming through. So Tim, if you're happy to just keep um, going through uh, these yeah, ones. Absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so one from Adam. Um, Tim, the 90 to 95% of nitrogen in the humus, is that available to the plants? Now, it's not available when it's in the humus. But the point of this is that the humus will keep it there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So, um, yes, it's really good to have a lot of humus. The point is that humus needs to be uh, processing and turning over. So some of the microorganisms that we talked about, uh, they are able to actually attack the, the humus and what's called mineralizing or releasing nutrients back out of the out of the organic matter. So we want to imp improve organic matter, but we want to improve more than anything life within the soil. That's why it's really important to us uh, to lay off some of the, or you know, be careful and more gentle with some of the potentially damaging inputs. Otherwise, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we could potentially de increase the soil organic matter without increasing processing of that, of that material. So while you've got humus, generally um, on any day when the sun shines, when a plant wants to grow, so you'll have um, enough turnover of that um, organic matter for that day's growth. Now, some of the um, some of the, the harmful effects of nitrogen um, come from too much water soluble nitrogen. They, you know, we need nitrogen because not we need we need nitrogen to build protein. The point is that we want that nitrogen to be slowly produced from the soil ecosystem at something close to where the rate of where the plants need it. And we still often have to use nitrogen fertilizers because when we're removing crops, we're taking material away. But also often cold, in cold weather, for instance, we know that soil organisms are not going to be working as well. So often at the beginning of the season, we can use some, some nitrogen. But we try to limit the amount of excess or water soluble nitrogen to what the plant can use. Now, we might have heard recently that doctors, for instance, are telling us that we might live longer if um, if we had a little less calorific diet. So you can think of your nitrogen needs in that same way, that we need to supply adequate nutrition to ourselves or to our plants in the form of nitrogen, but by over supplying them with nutrients, we can create weak and unhealthy plants. Almost all of the sucking pests, for instance, the aphids, and even things like um, 
Greg Lagodersmite and those sorts of things, what they are feeding off is excess nitrogen. Nitrogen has been applied in, a, say, a water-soluble form. It's been taken up by the plant, stored in excess beyond what that plant was able to use when it took it up. So now, when an aphid sticks its little proboscis, its little sucking tube, into that plant and gets into, uh, into the sap, it's got a protein-rich uh, diet so it can grow faster, reach maturity earlier, produce more generations in that season, and the population will expand and plants will suffer. Some, some of the uh, criticism, for instance, of some of the organic um, farmers that I work with, it, from the conventional agronomist looked at them and says, we can't have enough nitrogen. But those, uh, what those farmers will not have is they will not have um, uh, sappy growth or sucking pests. So um, the, the, uh, obviously, obviously there's some balancing to be done here to make sure we can try and get um, uh, enough nitrogen, but to avoid um, those really large, um, big lumps of application of nitrogen. So we can do it by uh, uh, I'll definitely encourage everyone to supply the nitrogen by increasing humus levels within the soil, but there are obviously things you can do with nitrogen fertilizer applications, like applying less more often, for instance, is going to help as well. And to, to start a system off and to, to get it going so you can produce, continue to produce organic matter, get that stored into the soil and lift your humus, you'd still um, start using some of those fertilizers, but try and use them um, more carefully and more sparingly. Yeah. Big question, all about nitrogen, isn't it? It's, it's a big, big um, topic. Um, so a question now from Justin. Um, are there any ideas on treating seeds with biological products or fish worm products prior to sowing? Uh, Yes, um, uh, often um, um, seeds can be uh, can be pelletized with all sorts of uh, nutrients. Um, we can also put uh, good biology with those seeds. Um, this is often where we use uh, lactobacilli or yeasts because they're very good at colonizing the roots of plants when um, when they first germinate and um, uh, seaweeds uh, for, could also be really good stimulants for for uh, plant roots. But um, yes, lactobacilli and um, uh, yeast. Some of the, some people might have heard of the inputs inputs called um, EM stands for environmental um, microorganisms. But EM is a liquid fertilizer, which one was one of the first to strike the market that uh, uh, can. In the modern era, that actually contain um, specially brewed um, varieties of, uh, of microorganisms. So, when uh, you know, 30 years ago, when there were few of these um, products, we were really just starting to learn how to apply soil biology from a packet rather than just relying on bulk comp compost and crop residues. Yeah, um, and another one sort of on the um, compost tea and the um, additional microbes. Um, Marnie has asked if additional microbes are added, e.g. via compost teas, is the soil able to sustain these or is it a short-term effect? Yeah, so um, um, a big point of this is not to simply put these products on but to create the ecosystem within the soil so that they survive in the soil when you're, they're out there. So yes, um, uh, then every aspect of management that we discuss, um, including you know, you know, maintaining soil cover, trying to keep soils open to moisture, uh, not overgrazing or compacting, not cultivating more than necessary, all of those things Design and designed and laying off herbicides and those sorts of things where we can and reducing our input of those where we can because 
they may be useful functional tools sometimes in our farming system, but recognising that every time we use them, we potentially have negative impacts from those as well. So we're trying to lay off those things and allow the soil ecosystem uh, to develop as much as possible. So yes, um, doing it at the start of the season and having kind seasons to us so that where it actually rains will uh, really help, but so will all those aspects of management. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and a question here from Linda. When making your own compost, how can we test the fungi to bacteria ratio of the compost extract prior to putting it onto the pastures? Well, that's usually done in a laboratory. I encourage you to look around to, for different laboratories because um, there, there, uh, traditionally there was one laboratory that did most of this work and now there are uh, many. So I don't want to favour any particular laboratory, but I will mention perhaps one because Southern Cross University at Lismore has a really excellent service and um, it's, and they are also very good at telling you if they, if they can't test the product adequately, where to send it. So um, mainly, and then of course, um, Elaine Ingham promotes her uh, microscope courses and that teaches people to look for these things um, themselves. So if you've got the, the interest to pursue that, then uh, contact with Southern Cross University and with Elaine, Elaine Ingham, Ingham, which is her laboratory is also based at Lismore. So they're, um, they're very good. But I'd also say you can do very good, you can learn to do a very good visual assessment of the compost as well. So, um, you know, with adequate moisture, for instance, uh, you should be able to, to uh, squeeze that product and compress it into a ball, you know, rub it yeah, into, a, into a ball, and then you should be able to break that apart with your fingers and it should fall apart again into very fine crummy material. And if it's a good compost, you should be able to roll it into a ball again, break it into fine clumps, roll it into a ball, and break it into fine clumps. You should be able to do that endlessly for days on end, and it will still do it. And then again, um, dark in colour, homogenous, in other words, mainly broken down into a similar material, no obvious big lumps of um, anything left in it, or, or as few as possible. And, um, and again, sweet and pleasant smells. In particular, the soil is an organism called Actinomycetes, produces that wonderfully warm, uh, comforting smell of perhaps a, of a soil after a first rain. Uh, so that sort of smell and no, no ammonium smells, nothing sharp that's going kind to of, um, hurt your nose. So uh, visual assessments, um, tactile assessments, you can soon learn to look at the compost. Great. Um, and while we're on the compost, one from Sandy who asks, must the compost be worked through the soil or just be applied to the soil surface? Um, if you can apply it to a soil surface in moist and overcast conditions, for instance, when you know it's going to be cool for a while, and if you can apply it over the top of, for instance, an established pasture so it's protected, then there's no reason why you need to till it in at all probably just as useful put on the soil surface. If you can apply, uh, supply enough compost um, or, or cover that compost with at least a less valuable um, mulch on the surface to protect it. Obviously compost that's completely exposed to the soil, uh, sorry to the sun and in the middle of summer is going to be dried out and eventually devalued considerably. So my first preference would be, in fact, to have enough soil life, like such as earthworms and other things, that you could put it on the surface and they would actually pull it into the soil for you and incorporate it. But um, you, you, uh, you know, in, in bare soil, you, you know, you could use a mulch over the top to protect it. And if you haven't got those conditions, then uh, just tickling it in. You really do not need to bury those sorts of compost very deeply. Um, tickling them in 
should be enough. Great. Um, and just one on the compost tea from Kim. Um, are the recipes that you provided, are they the application rate per hectare? No, I think that most of those, uh, th th those, um, those recipes should all be able to do at least four hectares. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, obviously, yeah. four is better, and obviously, um, that's assuming that you're putting them on um, at a favourable time when they'll get a little bit of rain or a little bit of biological activity. Just again, waiting for that rain at the moment, aren't we? <laughs> um, and one from Paul, we've just got a couple of questions left. One from Paul here to say, have you done an economic analysis of these treatments? Uh, well, you know, um, a lot of people are using these treatments and there, there are, uh, the compost teas, for instance, used at scale in this way, a fairly uh, new in their adoption, but they, especially the what we call the regenerative uh, agriculture movement, is really uh, experimenting with these very fast, and they are really quite cheap um, uh, 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 methods, especially if you do it yourself. Now there are people who would deliver a large truck to your place and do it for you, but these are really simple technologies that are ideal to learning, for you to learn to master, uh, to do um, for yourself. For instance, um, when you brew those compost teas, it, the point of brewing them is to um, shake some of the organisms off the compost, put them together with some plant food such as the, uh, the powdered fish, etc., um, in the in the tank which is being uh, stirred is supplying enough oxygen for those microorganisms to grow very, very fast. And the bacteria, for instance, in perfect conditions can double their population every 20 minutes. So they're growing really, really fast. So in fact, with very small amounts of ingredients, you know, and uh, they can be done with um, uh, very simple tanks. A lot of people that I see are buying the sort of tank that you might see in a small an even uh, vi uh, vineyard, so something that might take a thousand litres or a couple of thousand litres perhaps. Um, and then um, the point is to apply it as soon as possible so that the effect of that oxygenation and that feeding is retained. So obviously that's going to be much better if you can do it yourself rather than have them delivered for a very long period of time. The um, so they, in terms of an economic analysis, I think there are plenty of people out there at the moment experimenting them with them. Some um, academics and agronomists are beginning to take a serious interest in this, and so we we'll, we will we'll get some uh, some serious accounting over time. Um, and we're not suggesting that these techniques are absolutely going to replace our more expensive and bulky inputs, but they should be able to allow us to begin to really reduce those uh, those more expensive and bulky inputs. Brilliant. And, and one... As an exa another example, to, to, ma to make my own compost at home, I can make a much better compost, a much better compost than any commercial compost uh, operator. But um, I can't do it in very, very large units. So I can get very cheap compost delivered to my door from a commercial composter. So there's a compromise to be had here because if I can have uh, a very good worm farm, if I can um, make um, compost teas um, and then get my compost to delivered six or eight weeks before I want them and store them and enrich them with the compost teas and then put them out. I think I've got a really good compromise. I've got the bulky product quite cheaply and I've been able to value add to that. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, one final question, Tim. We've definitely maxed you out on the questions tonight. What should the first biological input be for someone new to this with a short history of no applications um, of chemical fertilizers and a focus on pasture management? Okay, so the first thing and most important thing is to try and manage what you've got as well as possible. So, um, you know, manage your rotations as well as you can to preserve as much organic matter as you can on your place. That's much more important than buying something in. If you can afford to buy in compost, well, they are wonderful things. And if you can do it based on the soil test, so are many of the other uh, inputs that I talked about before. But because compost is bulky and difficult to handle and sometimes almost as expensive to put out as it is to buy if you're not set up to do it, then I think that then learning to make these compost teas is actually a very, very good system because uh, it's really quite cheap. It is a do-it-yourself operation that isn't too hard to master and uh, there's uh, plenty of advice out there on how to get started, but really it's very simple. Fabulous. Thank you very much for that, Tim. Um, great practical information and also um, some real thought-provoking stuff um, that I know a lot of people in our little big community um, haven't really thought about. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, Tara, are you available yet or are you still on mute? I hope so, Georgie. Can you hear yeah, me? we can hear you. Yes, we can hear Excellent. you. Well done. Super. Thank you all for your patience tonight with a couple of um, technical audio issues. Um, thank you, everybody, for your questions. If anyone has any further questions, um, Georgie, I believe you'll be sharing Tim's contact information with the recording tomorrow. Is that right? Yep, that's the plan. So we'll get the recording up um, and send out an email to all those people who were registered. Um, you'll receive an email with Tim's contacts um, and all the big contacts and the recording tomorrow. Super. So thank you everyone for your um, attendance and participation this evening. Thank you, Tim, for a very informative, uh, informative webinar. Much appreciated. If everybody could please just stay online after we wrap up, there's a short post webinar survey that it would be much appreciated if you could uh, fill in for us. Otherwise, we look forward to catching you all next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>